Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight to hear from Black Public Media, Firelight Media, and New York Foundation for the Arts on the opportunities they all have. I'm uh, J.G. Takagi of Third World Newsreel, a progressive media center that pr prioritizes media by and about people of color and social justice issues. We do this through production, educational distribution, exhibition, training, and events like these. Um, this event is also sponsored by the Documentary Forum at CCNY, a center in the City College of New York dedicated to supporting documentary film and uh, nonfiction visual storytelling through multi-platform media. But I want first to have you join me in acknowledging that we're on the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape, Canarsie, Shinnecock, and Muncie peoples. We acknowledge and challenge the harm that continues to be inflicted upon indigenous and people of color communities here and abroad, which is why we all need to be part of the struggle for rights, equality, and justice. Some housekeeping notes, we're keeping attendees muted but welcome your questions and comments in the chat. I'm going to be doing short intros now, but you'll see longer information about our guests in the chat, and I'm going to let our guests tell you about themselves and their organizations and their work. So I want to introduce you to Denise Green from Black Public Media, one of the five national uh, multicultural alliance groups um, that work to diversify public television and other media platforms through funding and training. Denise Green, who I've known for a billion years, is Director of Program Initiatives, and she's going to tell you about what's coming up right now there. Great. Thank you so much, JT. It's always fun to get together around film and to partner with Third World Newsreel. I am, uh, as JT mentioned, the Director of Programs of Black Public Media. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the West Coast, uh, the, land, the unceded land of the Tongva. But BPM is based in Harlem. And um, although we have, with this virtual life, we have uh, BPMers uh, across the country. And um, I'm absolutely thrilled. I know it's a, a, I have, we have a deadline coming up. And so I'm excited to share um, our open call information um, for uh, to everyone this evening. But just shortly, um, BPM is a nonprofit organization that has been around for over 40 years, supporting filmmakers with funding, training, and distribution. Um, our current open call is for film proposals in all stages, for from pre-production, production to early post. Um, and we are awarding one film with production funding of up to $100,000. Um, and five films with seats in our three month incubator, which is a professional development program that ends with a chance to pitch for additional funding at 150,000. Um, and that that's with our pitch black event that happens in April 2023. So um, I, I'm really excited to just give you a, a little bit of the criteria to see if the projects that you're currently work, working on um, could would fit in our open call. And our deadline is this coming Monday at 11.59 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And I will definitely put my information in the chat for you to follow up if you have any additional questions. But in, for an overview of the criteria, we're looking for uh, proposals for nonfiction broadcast length films. Uh, and broadcast length is up to two hours. We're also seeking short uh, proposals for shorts, scripted or nonfiction, and that shorts uh, qualify as 30 minutes or less. And we also accept proposals for limited series. So that's either in the broadcast length or in shorts and limited meaning three to five episodes. We're open to all subject matter create and creative approaches as long as it centers on the global black experience and engages audiences around critical issues. Um, the applicants must have a professional credit on a prior media pr project and uh, and in a lead role. If if that if you're not uh, if you don't have a professional credit, 
Um, you can certainly have someone on your creative team, the core team, a senior producer, a senior director, um, also as um, part of a co-applicant. That senior support can also come in the form of uh, the actual commitment or a letter of interest. So don't hesitate to apply if you uh, have a strong project and you have someone in mind to, to join your team as a, in the senior capacity. Um, we do ask for you to submit a reel with the proposal, but that reel, again, can be earlier projects to illustrate your work. The, um, the team must include a person of African descent uh, in a creative role, producer, director, writer, or editor. Um, and the funding that we provide is a licensing agreement, meaning you retain the rights to your project but the agreement is for public media distribution like PBS stations or pbs.org. So again, the, um, the deadline is this coming Monday um, at midnight, and you can go to our website, blackpublicmedia.org to find out more information. There is a list of FAQs there. If you're not finding an answer to your question, feel free to email me at funding at blackpublicmedia.org. And you can follow us on all of our social platforms um, for other training and funding opportunities. Open Call is just one of many um, ways that we support our filmmakers. And the Open Call is an annual call, um, but then we have uh, other opportunities that are maybe targeted to certain social issues or, um, or devoted to training, um, just a range of things pop up. So follow us on social and I can't thank you enough, JT and, and everybody for listening. I hope you apply and uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Thanks, Denise. Thanks for dropping by and giving us this last minute in information, which I hope some of you will check out. Even if you don't make it this time, at least you'll know about Black Pub Public Media and have it on your radar for future grants and things like that. Um, right. And uh, thank you for taking the time to come and join us, Denise. Well, thanks for having me, and I'll answer some of these questions that pop up and okay, go great. in the chat. Okay. All right. And now we'll go on, everybody. So I'm happy to introduce our next two speakers. Um, Monica Navarro is Firelight Media Senior Director of Artist Programs, and she'll be talking about Firelight Media and what opportunities it offers BIPOC filmmakers. And Anna Wang is a Program Officer with New York Foundation for the Arts and she's coordinating the New York City Women's Fund for Media, Music, and Theater, and she'll talk about the variety of offerings NIFA has for filmmakers and uh, a special upcoming uh, particular grant. Uh, Monica, do you want to start? Uh, sure, I have a deck. If it's okay to share my screen. Um, um, yeah, I think I have to make you co-host, which I can do. But it's nice to meet you virtually JT <laughs> yeah, nice to meet and you thank well. you so much for having me and to meet you Anna and the rest of the folks here and um it's been a real expansive time of growth for Firelight so I just wanted to run through um all of the programs we have and you know hopefully there'll be time for questions or I can answer them in the chat but thought I could just use my time to kind of walk you through um so we you know launched Firelight with the doc lab but we have many programs now from emerging to mid-career and beyond the doc lab for folks. So it looks like I can share my screen. Yeah, I think you can. Um, okay, cool. Oh, okay. Um, hope you didn't judge all the tabs open on my... Okay. Uh, everyone can see it? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to... So hopefully, uh, if you're not familiar with Firelight, um, how, this is our founder, Stanley Nelson. How it started, you know, Stanley is a, um, a, one of the most prolific, I think, living American documentary filmmakers right now. Many, uh, much of his work and his films have been about black movements um, and figures in uh, both contemporary and historical. Um, and he launched Firelight Films, but, uh, he and uh, his partner uh, in life and at Firelight, Marsha Smith, co-founded Firelight Media um, to start, they were to formally 
start uh, mentoring the next generation of filmmakers of color. So as we're providing support and mentorship and producing documentaries, we're also cultivating audience resources for that work. And that's a really key part of our mission, not only in supporting the filmmakers, but in the impact and ways to reach those audiences. Um, so that's Marsha and Stanley right there. Um, so the Doc Lab, as I said, is our flagship program. Um, actually started by uh, Mabel Haddock, who recently passed away and really is a legend in the field. Um, she was the first director of the Firelight Doc Lab um, after a long tenure at Black Public Media. Um, but the Doc Lab is an 18 month fellowship uh, for US based filmmakers uh, from racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds who are working on their first or second feature. Um, we're really proud that the last two years we've been able to uh, give $25,000 in unrestricted grant funding for the fellows to use as needed to pay themselves to focus on their work to buy equipment to put it directly into the film to edit a, uh, to go shoot or edit a new work sample. Um, I think artists best knows how to use resources if they would be given unrestricted resources to, to advance their work. Um, so this, I think we're in the 13th uh, cohort now of and supported over a hundred filmmakers through the Doc Lab. And um, some really impressive folks have, have gone through um, from Don Porter and Pete Nix um, to Sabah Falayan, who is now the interim director of the Doc Lab. Um, we also have the Groundwork Regional Labs. Uh, these are three-day workshops that we do um, across the U.S. and in U.S. territories um, for more emerging filmmakers, um, knowing that uh, New York and California can be kind of these hubs for filmmaking, but there are many folks who want to make work where they are, and how do we provide access point? And also, um, we sort of serve as a way to knit together the like constellation of filmmakers, uh, a local film partners, like a film arts org and a PBS station and bringing those folks together for an intensive workshop to provide mentorship and knowledge sharing um, and sometimes mentorship beyond those groundwork workshops. Uh, we kicked off our first one in Detroit, I think four years ago, and uh, we recently had one in Ohio and um, you know, gone to Puerto Rico and the Southwest and Nebraska and um, just always looking to sort of reach folks uh, especially where we see uh, a need to be supporting more folks across the country. Um, we also have a fellowship in partnership with Frontline. This is a still from Jackie Olive's film, The Death is Our Business, which we produced last year out of the Frontline Fellowship. You can see that on Frontline's YouTube. It's a really beautiful film. Um, this is for filmmakers that are interested in uh, deep, deeply reported stories or investigative storytelling. Um, they get $70,000 in R&D and production funding. And there's a really robust um, in-kind and mentorship and production support. For, uh, Frontline has a lot of resources. So we're able to take advantage of their legal, their editorial, the journalistic resources, as well as they've got a phenomenal post house called The Outpost, which does all of the post production for the shorts, um, which is, you know, we've been really proud of that. And, um, you know, I'm going to talk more about the shorts, but uh, more shorts films. This is Hindsight, which was a pilot we did last year. But you know, we launched our shorts really to help our filmmakers keep building a body of work. Film, filmmakers graduated from the doc lab and would have success with that first or second feature, but it would still be a struggle to get funding for their next one. So we saw this as a way to help people just keep building a body of work, cultivate a relationship with that commissioning editor or that executive producer, and also serves to diversify um, the, the, the cobble of filmmakers that those series work with, as well as the stories they're telling. So the hope is that those filmmakers will get to continue to work with those series, maybe pitch them future projects or be commissioned to do work. But in, uh, we launched it with um, Frontline and, and well, you can look, we did one with a uh, field division called R100 Days that's on our website. That was right after the 2016 election. Um, those are really powerful films that were kind of done in response to that. And the more sustained programs we have now after launching those, the Hindsight Shorts, which was for Southern Storytellers, we now have a regional shorts program that's been rebranded as Homegrown. So this year it's called Future Visions for filmmakers from the American Midwest. And we also have a partnership with American Masters and that's the In the Making series um, to focus on the next generation of uh, 
kind of emerging BIPOC artists across all disciplines, but made by BIPOC filmmakers. Um, really looking at their practice and thinking like who might be a, you know, in 20 or 30 years an American master. And this is a picture of Damon Davis, um, who was featured in the first uh, season one of In the Making. Uh, one of the uh, really exciting area of growth for us is that we've started to do grant making uh, with our William Greaves Fund. This is William Greaves, who is a mentor of, of Stanley Nelson. If you're not familiar with his work, um, it's a really exciting body of work. If you're, I think one of his films is on the Criterion channel, but I would encourage you to dig into um, to the work. Uh, he was quite prolific and visionary. And we launched it in 2020 with the Research and Development Fund. Um, again, kind of listening to our filmmakers and the challenges they were facing. And I think this is the real gap we're seeing. I'm not sure who's in the audience, if you're first time, second time, or you consider yourself mid-career, but um, it's a real issue of how to sustain yourself as a mid-career filmmaker. It's certainly tough to make your first or second film, but how you continue to sustain yourself as a filmmaker um, and, you know, make the work that you want to make while working against some of the systemic and historical challenges. So we created this fund to support those filmmakers and give them substantial R&D funding really to develop the projects that were risky for other folks, but were the, the, the films they truly wanted to make. Um, and it's also exciting that we're starting to fund uh, filmmakers more throughout the diaspora beyond the US and its territories, but this was open to filmmakers uh, in Mexico, Colombia, Puerto Rico, and Brazil. Um, another thing we did that we added in 2021, given that we are still living in a pandemic, is we added a basic care stipend separate from the grant that is developed, meant to just develop your film project, but to pay for your health care or child care, any utilities, anything that is a necessity um, that can be a struggle to maintain that overhead for yourself so that you're allowed to work on your creative practice. And this year we launched another fund through this kind of umbrella of the William Greaves funds for mid-career. Ah, <laughs> it's been a long day, folks. Forgive me, I did, forgot to put the uh, bullet points for this. Um, but I'm the head of this fund, which is even like more, I'm probably going to blush. I blush that I forgot this. But I can tell you about the PBS Firelight William Greaves production fund. Um, it is a co-production fund, not a grant. Uh, with PBS, so the film would be intended for distribution with PBS, um, limited to folks in the US and its territories because it is public monies, whereas the R&D fund is uh, more international. Um, and, you know, I think this is in direct response, uh, not only to the kind of reckoning happening in our industry and in our country to address the inequities, but also the work Beyond Inclusion was doing, asking for PBS really to um, be more equitable in terms of the films they were funding and the filmmakers they were supporting. So uh, we're, we've had a long relationship with PBS. Stanley's produced a lot of films with PBS. Um, so it was really, you know, we're really excited to have some resources available to be supporting mid-career filmmakers and give them direct co-production funds and hopefully partner with folks like Black Public Media and the National Multicultural, other, the other partners in the National Multicultural Alliance and ITBS and, um, you know, just help these really help filmmakers just kind of either close, be finishing funds or significantly invest in them so that they're able to focus more on the creative practice and less on fundraising. Because uh, I think it's gotten more and more challenging to fundraise. Um, so how we can partner with folks to bring these films uh, to uh, the American audiences through public television um, is the goal with this, with this fund. Um, Ah, I don't know what I did. I guess it's, I did that a uh, magical thing where it like appears, sorry. Uh, so yeah, co-production fund. It's not just features. We also can support shorts through it. Um, the director, it's for directors, co-directors and producers. So that's really exciting. We, we, um, we really need to be uh, supporting and sustaining more producers of color. So it's wonderful that this is not just for directors but also for producers. Um, and we've, you know, work to define what mid-career is, but we will pro we probably will be like expanding the parameters of that just because that was probably the most, the most feedback and questions we got is how we defined mid-career. And um, I think people have been very creative in ways they've been able to sustain themselves. And so we need to be expansive in, 
in our thoughts about that. So my hope is that, um, cause this was the inaugural fund that we launched in 2022, but my hope is for next year that we might expand this, that uh, editors and cinematographers that are mid-career could apply as well. Um, it, you know, maybe they're directing or producing their first feature, but if they've got, if they've, you know, been in the industry as a working editor or cinematographer, I think they should be considered mid-career as well. And we do have some discretionary funds available for commissions and pre-sales. And again, that's to allow us to work with partners um, in public media. Um, you know, maybe if there is potential to do a commission or a pre-sale with like a POV or independent lens or American experience, you know, this would be a fund where we could pull those resources together to work with a filmmaker. Um, our last area of funding is our impact campaign fund. These are uh, the grantees from last year. We just announced uh, last week, the 2022. Um, this is just for filmmakers that have been supported through Firelight. Um, hopefully in the future it can expand, but it's really to make sure those films that have gone through Firelight's programs are reaching their audiences. That someone's uh, microphone is on. Um, and uh, this is addressing a resource gap. We did have an impact producers lab, but we were training folks for a career that is not tenable um, as there's less and less impact campaign funding. So it's why we kind of sunset that program and pivoted directly to giving funds for impact and engagement campaigns. Um, but it does not have to be limited to a doc lab film. Um, you could have gone through any program at Firelight, even groundwork. You could participate in a three-day groundwork workshop and you'd be eligible for these funds. Um, and then I just wanted to mention Beyond Resilience, if folks aren't familiar with this. We also launched this uh, series of screenings, uh, conversations, and uh, essays that we curate to kind of address like what it means to be making creative work um, during these like shifting times this is a really unique moment in our in our country's history. And um, if you're not familiar with it, it's on our YouTube channel and there's some really phenomenal conversations. Um, I would highly recommend the very first one as well as the black gaze. And um, there's just, there's lots of good conversations to dig into there um, that kind of get at the range of challenges of producing right now. So I'll stop sharing. That's um, that's kind of my quick and dirty run through of all our programs. Um, JT, do should I see if there's questions before we jump to Anna, or should um, I answer them in the chat? I think you can answer them in the chat, but I will also have a Q and A at the end of this. So, uh, but that okay. that certainly was a lot. <laughs> so there should probably be a question for each entity that you raised. But, uh, but thank you, um, Anna. Thank you. Tell us about what NIFA does and. Uh... Yeah, happy to. Thank you, JT. And um, thank you to everyone else. Um, really wonderful work being done. Um, yeah, so I, my name is Anna. I'm a program officer with New York Foundation for the Arts. Um, my program is the NYC Women's Fund. Um, and a little bit about NIFA, if you're not aware, um, New York Foundation for the Arts is an organization that works to empower the creative community by providing critical support, resources, and opportunities. Um, so for, for filmmakers, that often looks like grants. Um, we also do events such as tomorrow, we have a film distribution um, today event. Um, so you can see that on the NYFA website, nyfa.org. Um, upcoming at NYFA, there's a film distribution event. Um, and fiscal sponsorship, so for fundraising. Um, but a little bit about um, some of the grants that we offer, the um, open call right now uh, that's pertinent to filmmakers is the NYC Women's Fund um, for Media, Music, and Theater, which is a program that provides grants to encourage and support the creation of digital film, music, television, and live or online theater content that reflects the voices and perspectives of all who identify as women. Um, and just a quick note, uh, the fund does accept applications um, from any gender. So, you know, so long as the other guidelines are fulfilled, um, don't have to necessarily uh, worry too much about that. Um, but it is administered by New York Foundation for the Arts in partnership with the City of New York Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and is part of a ground series 
groundbreaking series of initiatives to address the underrepresentation of women in these industries. Um, the fund awards $2 million um, in each cycle. So this is the fourth cycle that the fund has been open. Um, the fund opened in July and applications will close November 1st, uh, 2022 at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Especially for filmmakers, I would highly recommend applying in advance if at all, if you, if you are planning to apply, um, just to avoid any upload issues with your work samples and everything like that. Um, for the media category, we've actually already done an info session which I'm happy to um, actually link here so that um, folks have access to that. Um, but that's gonna provide um, more of an in-depth overview of the media category. Um, there's also ample time that we spent answering questions at the end. Um, but just to talk a little bit about the fund, again, the media categories, um, are meant to support finishing funds for film, television, and digital projects. So in order to be eligible, because these are finishing funds, projects do need to have completed principal photography. Um, so essentially projects need to have finished filming aside from some pickups um, in order to be eligible. And this is mainly because um, as part of this project-based grant, we do uh, NIFA staff does track completion, uh, meaning that if you receive the award, you have one year to um, finish out the project. And applicants can apply in one of the following categories, uh, fiction, feature, short, and web series, documentary, feature, short, and web series, um, and more about the maximum asks and the kind of guidelines around the, uh, those categories can be found on the website. Um, but yeah, essentially those are the categories, that's the fund. I'm happy to answer a lot of questions about it because there, there are several guidelines specific to each category. So I would highly recommend checking out the website to um, take a look at those. Uh, we do ask for work samples, a budget, um, but luckily we do also provide an FAQ on the website that should hopefully help answer some of the budget questions um, and help to fill out your application. Um, and yeah, essentially that's the fund. Thanks, Anna. Does, does NIFA still have that um, grant that, uh, that no strings grant? Yes, so there are a couple of just cash grants. Um, we just closed the Canadian Women's Artists Award. It's a little bit specific. You have to be a Canadian uh, woman artist living in New York State, um, but that is open to filmmakers and that's a $5,000 cash grant. The Niska Naifa Artist Fellowship is one of our longest standing programs and that has been around since like the 80s and that accepts um, film projects, but I don't believe um, that cycle runs specific categories each year. I don't believe this year we're um, accepting film projects, but I would double check the website just to be sure. That's a $7,000 unrestricted cash grant. So there are some cash grants um, and there's other um, awards and grants open at NIFA kind of, you know, have to check back on the website. There's new opportunities kind of opening up and um, yeah, hopefully find something that would be applicable to your project. Uh, but if you're also interested in fiscal sponsorship, I would highly recommend looking into NIFA. Um, and also if you're interested in some of those education-based resources um, around film distribution, marketing, that kind of thing, uh, the fiscal sponsorship department also runs um, online workshops such as this. Great, thanks. And I know that uh... You have lists of different resources and grants and uh, a series of different categories on your mm -hmm. website that's handy to people, not just in film and media, but in other arts categories as well. Exactly. Um, yeah, the fund is um, open for music production and theater production, too. So if you're an artist working in multiple disciplines um, and have a project in mind, definitely check it out. And I saw a question about um, shorts 
it's, it's features, shorts, and web series, but just noting that for this particular program, we're only accepting one application per like applicant or key collaborator. So for example, if you're the director of a feature, but you're also producing a short, you wouldn't be able to submit um, two applications uh, just to remain fair to the large pool of um, artists and, and the uh, robust community applying for these grants. Thank you. And yours is November 1st, right? November 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern time. But definitely, okay. definitely apply before. It's there's nothing yeah, worse than if you get snagged on a technical delay or you're uploading your work sample or something. Um, just make sure that all of those uh, you know things are accounted for. Great. And with Monica, with your the numerous programs you offered, are there deadlines we have to think of now or how does that work or is it rolling deadlines on those that's a good question um no with the deadline for the doc lab tends to be late spring early summer so the deadline's usually in june so we're in the selection process right now for the next doc lab cohort so i would say to definitely sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social media just to kind of be current of when a deadline opens up um, the William Greaves funds were summer, so that was a July deadline for both funds. So we're also going through the review process right now. Um, but we will be probably having a call uh, this fall uh, for some of the regional shorts. Um, so that's why I would really signing up for the newsletter is probably the best. And that's just at the bottom of our website. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna be uh, we're determining, but I. I don't want to say what region we're going to focus on in case it changes, but it was the American South and then the Midwest. So we're we're focusing on a different region. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's based in New York on this call, but uh, and then we'll also be. Uh, I don't think I mentioned with the Frontline or the American Masters. Those have been nomination processes. Um, so certainly I could um, add JT to my list of, is there anyone to nominate, uh, for this program? If someone's, you know, produced a shorter feature and is ready that, uh, th those shorts are, the regional shorts are a bit more for merging, but we're, we are seeing with frontline American masters, that is probably more for like, if not mid career that you you feel pretty established, you've produced a couple shorts or a feature, um, because, uh, the process of working with those strands is pretty intensive so if you're not used to that level of notes uh that can be it can be a, a, a challenging process for a more emerging maker so i'll just say i wouldn't say it's rolling but we're as since we've expanded and have so many programs we are trying to find a a good rhythm and cadence to you know when when these opportunities will happen but i would say spring and summer and sign up for the newsletter to see if any of these shorts opportunities open sooner. And the impact campaign fund also has a spring deadline. Great. And then yes, add me to the nominator. <laughs> I will. But also um, it's the sound, since some of these sound like they would re be restrictive in terms of what we call mid-career or someone who would be ready for a frontline thing. It also seems like that creates a possible pathway for people who don't have that to be some kind of position in a production like this so that they would learn all those all those things. So I don't know if that's something that you all are thinking of, but I hope you are because uh, that will also help the pipeline so that people more people will know what's involved in a PBS frontline kind of relationship. So Yeah, certainly, um, you know, I think our filmmakers are always looking to hire uh, APs, assistant editors, and it's really exciting what like the BIPOC doc editors are doing of asking to create like more associate editor and assistant editor tracks so folks can start to work their way up. Um, so I usually see that folks like do those calls, you know, through listservs or through Brown Girls Doc Mafia, but um, I think if there's an interest to work on a production, you know, I think I'm happy if you want to reach out to me or through JT, um, just, you know, if someone's eager to work on one of the projects, either like a doc lab film or work one of the mid, I think that's a really good idea, JT. Like how could the mid career filmmakers be using that opportunity to help other folks um, get their foot in the door and get experience working with someone who's maybe 
you know, got a few more projects under their belt. Great, and I see- if I can help facilitate that, I'm happy to. Okay, great. Um, I see a question in the chat about age eligibility. Uh, Samir, is that directed to me or Anna? I guess both. Um, I can just jump in. For the NYC Women's Fund, there is no age eligibility requirement, nor is there like emerging or mid career. Um, it's mainly just project based. So um, submitting a project uh, that it has finished filming um, and looking for finishing funds. I do think some of our programs, especially ones that are underwritten by Corporation for Public Broadcasting or PBS, do require you to be at least 18 years old. Um, they often, often also ask not to be a student. So I think just look at the eligibility, but otherwise we don't really have parameters about age as well. Um, but the student is more that sometimes if you are a student, it's a it's possible that the university or college you're at might actually have the own the intellectual property to your work, um, not you. Uh, so that's why we sometimes see that like funds say not open for students. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, we have had, we actually have to, uh, we work with a local arts organization in New York. So we actually have reserved spots in the doc lab or at least have had for the past four years uh, for filmmakers that are New York based that are under 30. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we try to make sure that we're being equitable in terms of age. But next doc is a really, I don't want to make assumptions about your age, Samar, but if it's a question of like eligibility, like I'm not sure what you're asking in terms of the cutoff, but next doc is a really good organization that I think is for under 25 filmmakers if you're not familiar with that organization. Okay, um, and uh, looks like no one's posting questions. <laughs> All right, someone's asking if you can share the PowerPoint you had, Monica. Um, I would rather direct you to the website uh, that actually has all of that information and more. So I'll put that in the chat. Word, thank you. Um, and also someone's asking, um, are international student non-US residents eligible for these grants? So for the NYC Women's Fund, there isn't um, any like restrictions about that. However, you do need to be a uh, resident of one of the five boroughs of New York City, um, just because that is a um, NYC mayor's office funded program. Some of the other NYFA programs do have um, some specific guidelines, but in general, um, you don't need to necessarily be um, like a US citizen, if that makes sense. Um, some of them have like residency requirements which just ask for an address, um, no like necessarily like paperwork. Um, and some don't accept uh, submissions from students for similar uh, reasons to Firelight. Um, but yeah, the NYC Women's Fund does accept um, applications from students so long as you're a New York City resident or have a, um, you know, key collaborator that's a New York City resident. Oh, that's great. <laughs> For those of you who yeah, are finishing your project. Uh, kind of similar, like we don't have strict, it's just, are you based in the US? We do not ask citizenship status or, so when we say residents, like where do you reside? Like Anna's saying, it's not in terms of like, are you a legal resident? Um, we've actually supported undocumented filmmakers as well. So um, we don't ask your status in that way. It's just if you're based in the US. But again, in terms of student, if you're a student, I would just look at the particular program you're interested in because some of the eligibility requirements are pretty specific that it's not for a student. But we've certainly had like folks in the doc lab that like, recently finished um, their their studies. Um, 
so I would just look and see the programs but I think if you're saying the so it's yeah hard to know when you say the grants which whether you're directing that to me or Anna or which programs let's say if it's a specific program I can tell you but our only grants are for mid-career or the impact campaign fund other than the like grants we do in addition to the fellowships if that makes sense so you really just have to look at which program fits you based on like the stage of your career and what your like needs are in terms of developing a specific project or um or your interest in like short form i hope that answered the question um yeah i guess we just have to check out the website there but uh what a person's asking about uh sample work and what you're looking for yeah, for the NYC Women's Fund specifically, because it is for finishing, um, the each category will ask for a short sample and a long sample. Um, the short sample for the shorts and web series categories, um, let me just double check. The short sample should be about up to five minutes. And the long sample is up to 40, but it doesn't need to be necessarily polished. Um, it just needs to give the panel like a sense of what your project is um, and kind of, you know, like best showcase what you have so far. Um, the long sample for, I'm sorry, the short and the long sample for the feature category is up to 10 minutes. And then the long sample is between 45 to 60. Um, yeah, but it doesn't need to be um, necessarily finished footage, but it shouldn't be like a sizzle reel or a trailer, and it shouldn't feature clips from other projects because they're project-based grants. That's such an important point. I've seen a few of those recently, and it's very hard to judge someone's work when you're using someone else's work as, as an example. It's rare, but yeah, definitely don't do that. Um, it's such a tough question, Kima. Um, we are moving towards the, uh, certainly with this new William PBS William, Firelight William Greaves Fund and I think future Firelight initiatives. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the DOT core application, but there's been some work over the past year to um, update that. So it's launched now, the not, it's now it's called the, it's kind of been rebranded as the nonfiction core application 2.0, um, really just taking learnings from folks who run fellowships and labs and grant makers, um, and also just the shifts in the field. Like, you know, there's sometimes been either folks have asked directly or indirectly want to know questions around like accountability and like care for like participants and um, just what's your practice in terms of like your relationship to your work. So those are like now more directly asked in the and streamlining just some of the language in the nonfiction core application. So that also at, and it was also an attempt to as the goal of the nonfiction, the, the dot core and now the nonfiction core application so that you're not having to redo the the your grant your proposal every time for every funder um it's always going to need to be a little bit tailored to their mission and what the program is but i'm giving you all that context to say that we are moving towards they say a 10 to 20 minute sample so we kind of held ourselves to that because that's what was established with the other folks that helped um revamp that um unless you have a rough cut and then if you've got a rough cut we'd like to see the rough cut otherwise um you know, 10 to 20 minutes. It can be hard to judge with less than that. Um, and it's also a lot of time when you're reviewing 10 to 20 or 50 projects to watch more than 20 minutes, unless I said you actually are pretty advanced and have a cut. So what we look for, I mean, you know, usually your proposal, you are saying what your vision is for the film, um, what your sensibility is, um, why you're making this film, why it matters. And then have you executed it? I mean, what I guess I look for in the sample is if what I read on paper, I'm getting a sense of who you are as an artist and what your vision is, what this, and you know, then I wanna see, does it match? So sometimes it's really, I mean, you always wanna be like wowed by a sample, not like see everything on paper and then it doesn't quite deliver. Then it's like, okay, maybe there's more work to do or they, you know, need more time to like kind of get there filmmaking up to like the what's in their head so I guess 
it just really should reflect like what you propose that you are doing. I also appreciate, even if it's like one scene, um, a trailer or a sizzle to me can be good as like a thesis statement and giving me sort of the sense of like the mood or the topic or like, um, but it doesn't tell me how you cut a scene or what your pacing is like. Um, or how I, like how I'm give me a chance to kind of breathe with the material and get connected to it, but it's fine to have a sizzle or a trailer. But it's nice to have like if not like an an entire like edited sequence at least like a, a couple scenes or a scene just so we have a sense. And then how is this representative like your approach or that participant or that like or a theme in the film? So something that gives me a sense of what you're trying to do. So I would say that's what I'm looking for. And yeah, polished. I mean, we don't expect it to be polished in terms of like color mixed and color corrected and final music, but it's really like understanding who you are as a filmmaker. And, you know, there have been times when we've supported folks very early and they haven't even shot that much, but what they have shot is really powerful. And it's like matches what they put on paper in terms of their intention as, as a filmmaker. Right. And I guess like more, like you want to make it irresistible. So someone like is so excited to see more or like, you know, really wants to support you. Okay. And um, how about in terms of applications, are you expecting um, that the director has also had a plan for their distribution, outreach and all, all that? Is that part of what you're expecting to see in a proposal? Um, for the Women's Fund, yes. It doesn't have to be um, you know, a concrete plan yet. And only 20% of the awarded amount can be used towards marketing and distribution. Um, it's mainly just to get a sense that the project has thought about it, um, you know, knows what their audience is going, you know, their goal audience would look like. Um, and you know, has given some some thought into the feasibility of distribution. Yeah, I would say kind of similarly, like we want to know that you've, that's a good way to put it. We don't know that you've given it some thought. You don't need to have like a fully like outlined, and, you know, staggered distribution plan, but who it, who do you think the audience is for your film and what, ways are you planning to like reach that audience so you do have some goal in mind and it's just a revealing about like what your goals are and how who's going to connect with your work I and mean, i think a lot like there's the process of making the work but to me exhibiting the work and the dialogue you have with an audience is as much a part of the practice and so who who do you want to be in dialogue with with your work that i think that's that's what we look for really in in distribution um in that distribution question um i hope that didn't i hope that's clear great thanks so there's a question there about uh many grant granders want to see scene work but what if the documentary is more focused on archival media and sit down interviews I mean, that's still a scene. I mean, I don't know if you're saying scene work like verite or observational footage, but how you work with archival still should have pacing and rhythm and what the interplay is between that and an interview still tells us something about um, you as a storyteller. Um, so I would say it's, it's if it, I mean, many films that have been through our programs have been archival. Our founder has done, most of his career has been on archival work. Um, and there's there's so many rich and creative ways that you can make an archival film. I don't think I don't think a sit down interview or archival is like a very there's so many ways that could be interpreted and that can be expressed and executed. So again, it's like what what are you doing with that material so that it's not static? Great, and I saw that in the chat uh, that. And that you're hoping that there'll be another round, but we, we don't have a guarantee yet. Yeah, exactly. All right. So that means everyone if you can apply, apply now for all these things actually is apply now. Uh, who knows what will happen next year? Um, 
Though for Firelight, you have to wait till next year because actually you said that you're going to be more spring summer based in terms of the deadline. So, um, someone's asking about samples. Oh, yeah, I don't know if you you all do this. Some funders do where they have examples of like winning proposals that that can be shared with uh, applicants. We don't. I know that Brown Girls, if you're a member, they've got some uh, resources where folks have um, have shared that. I mean, um, that's a challenging one because you don't want like it to be formulaic, but you certainly it is it is helpful. It's just that um, I mean, I'll just say because you know I started as a filmmaker as a I started as an independent filmmaker and I took workshops through Women Make Movies Production Assistance Program and there's lots of proposal writing workshops. And I actually took everything I learned from that workshop, but also everyone that was in that room, like we became a resource to each other. We stayed connected. We looked at each other's proposals, gave each other feedback. So I would say like, there's probably folks in this room that would be like a good peer resource for you. Um, so there, there are just kind of general grant writing strategies that I think you could gain from a proposal or grant writing class or even, um, since this is like affiliated with City College. I also, when I was getting started, cause I went to art school, I actually went to like our administrator where they do the kind of like career, like the career services that they have. And I asked them because a lot of artists need to apply for like residencies and grants and fellowships. Like they actually were the first folks that ever gave me feedback on a proposal. So I would just encourage you to kind of look at like what already like exists out there that is specifically for that, like for proposal writing or grant writing. And that's really just structuring your ideas. So that's why I would say it's not necessarily that one is going to give you the template that that's exactly how to do it. But I think more it's thinking about like, how do you organize and structure your ideas? How is this project? What does it say about you as an artist? Like, I like to know, like, if this is your, whether it's your first film or your third film, like what kind of body of work do you want to create? Or what are the things you want to say about the film? What are the things that you're concerned about and what's your sensibility or your like points of reference? So what can be, what I have like found actually helpful in embracing the proposal writing process is it allows me to like step back and think not just how do I communicate the vision for this film, but why this film? The topic is just the why, like why, why this film needs to be in the world. How is it part of like a broader conversation and building on maybe like other films that are similar thematically? How is it different? How is it additive? And, um, you know, then again, the, the distribution audience, it's just like, where, what's the intersection? Where are folks going to find it? What are going to be the like platforms and vehicles for folks to reach your work? Um, and so like, look, maybe look at all of those elements of a proposal as ways to just like communicate and not everyone is a good proposal writer. So that's where it's like, know your strengths and know what are not your strengths. And that's where you bring someone that like, I mean, I'm producing a film with an incredibly talented director who's not good at writing a proposal. He's good at kind of like free writing. And then myself and the other producers can like take that free writing or that like stream of conscious writing or a conversation with him and we can kind of shape it into a proposal. So, you know, you might have friends or collaborators or folks again in this room that that's their strength. They're really good writers. So they're really good at organizing. Um, so I would say, I don't know, to me, you have to sometimes be really creative and there's like resources you don't even realize you have. And the folks next to you might be as much a resource as myself or Anna is to you. And you know, y'all you're in the trenches together. So you'll like support each other and celebrate each other's wins and learn, you know, when there's setbacks as well to just keep improving. Great, that's helpful. Plus everyone, uh, when you're writing, cause this happens to me all the time is that you have to get someone else to read it who doesn't know your project, doesn't know you. So, uh, cause you get so tied up in your head and then someone will say, I don't even understand what you're trying to make here. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I didn't make that clear. And then it makes you have to rethink what, what you're doing. So, so make sure that you build connections with people who don't necessarily know your other work or, or you even so that you can do. So, um, and I was wondering, is do, do people feel like a proposal writing seminar would be useful? You can put it in the chat if you think it would be. So, 
All right. Um, let's see. Do we have other questions? I'm seeing a lot of yeses. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I guess uh, we know what we should uh, be coming up with. So. Um, yes. Okay. We will do that. So. <laughs> All right. Um, and you think that if we use the the core application that would be a good basis for even uh, thinking about it. So. Yeah, the new nonfiction core application. Okay, great. All right. Um, if I don't see any other questions in the chat, I'm going to let... Teresa, our... did yours get answered? Or was that... Teresa Long had one, but I don't know if that was kind of answered. How do the application films stand out? Oh, yeah. If you can address that, that'd be great. I guess I did this to myself. As a book. <laughs> I mean, I, I, the only thing I'd add to what I said is how does your project or film reflect the mission? So I see that you've got a nice good grant and that's wonderful. I think sometimes be very clear, I guess two things, be very clear about your needs. Like the nice good grant is incredible and then build on that. Like be very clear about like how that helped you, what you were able to do, but like what's needed now um, that will help you get to that next stage. And then I also think like, you know, do you really feel like you as a filmmaker or your project fit the mission or the organization? Um, so I do think that's where I think it's helpful to like tailor once you've got like a strong proposal based on the core application, that's where a little tailoring is just thinking about like, how do I fit the mission? Cause that's, that's where it's worth so that when a reader or a funder that is often something they're looking for. Like this is exactly like who this fund or this grant or this initiative was designed for. So it's good, to, I think, to be, you know, acknowledge the support you've gotten or if you've been doing it just like with like sweat equity, I guess, and just been investing like your own time, but, you know, be really clear on the needs and, um, and where you fit the mission. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I'll just, just add that like a lot of these programs, the panel does change every year. So every year there should be like likely a unique panel. Um, so I wouldn't, um, you know, worry too much about like, you know, what stood out before, like what I can do to stand out from the crowd, but exactly like, how do you fit your mission? Like how do you best, um, communicate your project and then also just taking a look at the guidelines since each of these programs are so different and a lot of the times you can have a really wonderful project but it's just not the grant for you um, but you know if you do some research you might find an opportunity that would be a good fit I think the panel issue is also pr pretty important because even with NISCA it's panel based so that one year you might not get it but then the following year you could because um, there's different people yeah. who are that's looking true. at your proposal so uh, don't give up hope <laughs> all right um i think i don't see any new questions in the chat so i think uh thank you both very much and thank denise who was on earlier um everyone we put the websites in the chat and you'll also get it in your survey so you'll be reminded but even if you don't follow a deadline that's coming up um, these groups are around and have been around and will continue to be around to support. So you want to keep up to date with them, join their listserv, things like this, and, uh, and attend events because you notice that the, the folks here talked about, refer to other groups like Brown Girls Duck Mafia, um, there's the whole Gotham Week thing. Next week is IDA's Getting Real Conference and, uh, so there's a lot of opportunities to interact with the filmmakers who have been, been getting funds and to become part of groups that, um, and there's a whole bunches of them where you can get support from other filmmakers in terms of reading script, reading proposals and things like that. And uh, so it, it takes some getting out of your current circle and joining other circles so that you get to know people. And as you know, in this field particularly, 
it's uh, a lot of it is who you know so it helps to know people so that they say oh yeah I met them at the at that zoom meeting about funding so that you can uh, refer to them so um, I see here uh, okay so I think that's it for tonight thank you both so much I hope this has been helpful to everyone who's been on the line um, and remember these groups names New York Foundation for the Arts or NIFA Firelight Media um, Black Public Public Media and all there's a whole multicultural uh, alliance of um, groups that includes uh, Latino broadcasting vision makers um, Pacific Islander Center for Asian American Media <laughs> yeah. the one thing Island I'll add about yeah. thank you for mentioning getting real at, uh, I know we're at time but um, it's it's hybrid so if you're not in LA you know it's still very inclusive that you can participate online and there's a number of like discounts through some of these groups um, and the virtual passes are there no one is going to be turned away if the virtual pass would be cost prohibitive for you so definitely look at the getting real site and see if you can afford the virtual pass it's a good organization to support if you can't they've got like information so you can tell them and you don't have to give a reason you just have to say this I really want to attend and so just that would be a really good, there's going to be a lot of good conversations and master classes. We're doing a Beyond Resilience uh, session on Indigenous storytelling. And I'm also organizing a breakout for Latinx and um, Asian American and Pacific Islander filmmakers. So would encourage folks to check out the schedule um, for that because that happens every two years. So it's, it's, a, it's a good convening. Great. Thank you, JT, and nice to meet you, Anna, and everyone else behind the scenes. And do reach out, um, you know, if you're interested in Firelight's programs. Great. Thank you both very much for for talking tonight, and thanks everyone else for participating. And uh, hope to see your proposals going in places and having your films made. Good night, everybody. <laughs>